this is this will be the last session we have two talks left for today um, so the next speaker is professor kartik raman uh, kartik you know we are very informal here so uh, <laughs> So uh, formally, Karthik uh, is a professor in the Department of Biotechnology, IIT Madras, and he's associated with several interdisciplinary centers, the IS IBSC, the RBC, DSAI, and many, many more, I am sure, within IITM. Uh, so Karthik, of course, uh, did his PhD with Professor Nagasma Chandra in ISC. He had subsequently a stint of postdoctoral fellowship with Andreas Wagner in uh, you know, University of Zurich. Subsequently, he moved uh, to IIT Madras as a faculty, where he is now has been there since I think 2011. Uh, informally, I know Karthik since 2007. Uh, I mean, we our paths have crossed many, many times. So uh, you know, so we share uh, taste in terms of research questions as well. So it's always fun to have Karthik. I'm pretty sure this last session would be cool. So over to you, Karthik. So looking forward to your talk. Thanks yeah. for coming. OK. <laughs> now, I like to keep my talks uh, shorter than so that uh, we can have lots of discussion. And the last time I was here, we went on and on and on with the discussion. And that's always a lot of fun. Uh, thanks a lot, Arijit, for the invitation. It's uh, uh, always wonderful to be here. And uh, really wonderful program. I just couldn't join all of it. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears. I think you've been exposed to some aspects, like I think centrality measures and a few other things and so on. But I'm going to sort of wear a machine learning person's hat today, uh, unlike the usual modeling talks I give. And uh, my talk is slightly contrived, the title. Uh, so learning on, using, and from networks in biology. I'll, I'll uh, tell you how and why networks are so useful in biology. You probably already know it from today. But uh, graph theory is like super useful in biology. It has many, many applications in biology. And there are many biological problems that naturally map onto graphs. It could be pathfinding in metabolic uh, networks. It could be predicting protein-protein interactions. Very surprisingly, something like read assembly. Again, is a graph theory, uh, graph theoretic problem. Identifying clusters or modules in large networks. Just community detection. It's a very, very classic problem in uh, network science uh, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> That's what I'm going to focus on for the majority of my talk today. And network biology itself has uh, gained widespread popularity where people have been constructing and an analyzing a wide variety of biological networks. It could be metabolic networks, protein interaction networks, signaling networks, gene co-expression networks, and so on. And there are many applications in machine learning. I'm going to try and touch upon a uh, few of these today. So I already mentioned these networks to you. You might have seen these kinds of pictures everywhere. So this is a very famous uh, picture. This is, uh, you must have seen it in my first slide as well. Very nice simply because it is a very painstakingly experimentally determined data set. So they actually knocked out one, uh, genes in yeast one by one and figured out what happens when you knock out the gene in yeast. Does it grow fast? Does it grow slow? Does the organism die and so on? And they made a very colorful network as well. Um, and for a you know, more simple, for the children out here, even food webs are actually networks. Right? So who eats whom is actually a network. Twitter is a network. Facebook is a network. And so are these kinds of different networks. So how do you identify modules in biological networks? It's a very classic problem in graph theory. Uh, it's always nice to start with the history of a problem. Um, <clears throat> When I teach this, I usually go into the history of graph theory itself, which is uh, Euler's seven bridges and so on. If somebody hasn't uh, seen that, you should go and look at it. It's a really fun story to read about. But this is equally fun, and it uh, is something known as uh, Zachary's Karate Club uh, data set. Um, uh, so, so there's only uh, about 30 odd people in this uh, Karate Club. And what happened was, when Zachary was collecting this uh, data about the social network in the Karate Club, the Karate Club had a fight. And the, the club split into two. And it turns out that with the social network that this uh, Wayne Zachary had uh, uh, figured out, he could accurately predict what the two factions would end up being, how the, the two teams would uh, separate out in the uh, Karate Club data set. So this, is, this happens to be a gold standard for community detection algorithms. And as an aside, there are t-shirts which say that if you cannot solve the Karate Club problem, go home. Right, so you, there's no, so that's the least simplest problem that one needs to solve using uh, community detection algorithms. And um, apparently there's a karate club club. So I don't know if anybody else uh, mentioned the karate club today. Otherwise, there is a small trophy that's passed on to the first person in a networks conference who talks about the karate club problem. So 
So how do you perform community detection or clustering? So this is a very interesting uh, problem. We all have a rough notion of what we mean by a community or a cluster. Crudely speaking, we would say that um, and there are many algorithms. The question is how well can you apply them to biological networks? Crudely speaking, the intra edges are much more than the inter edges. So there are groups of nodes that are more closely knit with, amongst each other than the connections they have to the rest of the world. So if you look at say citations here, so if you see mathematical ecology papers, cite mathematical ecology papers more often, but they occasionally do cite agent based modeling papers, uh, very rarely do they cite statistical physics papers or structure of RNA papers and things like that. But you have these clusters of papers where there is a lot of intra citation uh, uh, going on. And you can also take well, some very large networks and decompose them into some sort of tractable networks for working further with them. Okay. So, here is the problem that we try to solve. This, is, this was the dream challenge. I do not know how many of you are aware, uh, aware of the dream challenges. The best part is dream challenges, especially for non-biologists trying to dabble in biology, you get high quality data sets with like good ground truths and good um, or whatever. You have very nice descriptions of the data set. So, you can really hit the ground running trying to develop new algorithms to uh, wade through the complex data sets. <coughs> And there were six networks that they gave here. So there was a protein interaction network, signaling networks. Here are all the statistics. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, and there were two challenges. Can you identify modules in individual networks and also across networks? So there is some sort of correspondence between these networks. Uh, and can you actually uh, use multiple uh, information from multiple networks to identify modules versus information from a single network? And the modules were ranked, it was like really uh, expensive evaluation. It would take us uh, at least a few days to evaluate uh, a given uh, prediction. So suppose you assign communities, it takes a lot of time to run it against a 180 genome wide association uh, study data sets. And there was a particular tool that was used for this purpose. What is the actual challenge here? The challenge is that they never gave us STAT, IL-17, JAK and so on. We just got 1, 2, 3. So you have a completely anonymized network, so they could be, it could, it could have been Twitter for all we care. So we got a network with no, with just node IDs and no notion of what a particular node is, what is the protein, what is its sequence, what might be its function or whatever. And there, there is no ground truth available to train. So all you can do is to do some sort of unsupervised clustering. So some network properties you have to look at to see if you can, these are the network properties that are, you have to hypothesize that this is going to be more important for diseases. The, the challenge was to actually uncover nodes that are relevant in disease. So we had to predict modules of proteins, groups, communities, groups of proteins, I'm using all the, uh, the terms that people interchangeably use to identify which of these, to identify a group of proteins that are likely to be implicated or enriched in a particular disease. And they also had this condition, the module sizes had to be somewhere between 3 and 100. So you can't have very large modules or very small modules. And we also uh, used some heuristics. We figured out that 60 is a good number if you have to improve your performance and things like that. So there are many algorithms. I told you there are like communities of people who work on these community detection algorithms. So how do you apply these to biological networks? And this is a wonderful paper. Uh, uh, we are also consortium authors on this paper. But anybody who is interested in this should look at it simply because it talks about 75 different methods which were applied to these data sets. So, and it, it groups these methods into those that do kernel clustering, modularity optimization, those that are based on random walks, and so on and so forth. So you had a complete battery of methods that people tried out with varying degrees of uh, success. What was our approach? We looked at extending classic approaches. We looked at what is known as a core module identification, essentially trying to identify the core of a normally predicted module, which is you know, more tightly connected and so on, and also overlapping modules. This wasn't what was asked of us, uh, asked of us in the challenge, but we anyway said that overlapping modules is going to be more interesting or more practical in the biological context. So there are many measures of community quality. Uh, for example, there is something known as modularity, which says what are the chance, uh, uh, what, what fraction of edges are there between, uh, do you expect to have between communities and what do you really have. So it, it measures that kind of uh, um, uh, number and so on. So this is uh, by Newman. And there are other measures known as conductance, uh, there is something known as seal, and there is also a Markov chain clustering or a random walk based approach that is used to 
build these communities. There are so many algorithms that are there and these are your baselines. This is just out of the box. You open up a standard package in Python, you will be able to have access to many of these algorithms. Just run them, you have your baseline. This is your normal vanilla algorithm that has been perfected for non-biological data sets. How do you adapt them to biological data sets? What kind of tricks and tweaks do you have to do? So we try to identify small and structurally well-defined communities. We said that only the compact core modules are likely to have greater disease relevance. And we also did an ensemble clustering, which is based on consensus from different community detection algorithms. And this idea I really like. We said we will try to perturb the network and identify persistent communities. I'll tell you what we did. So because even if you disrupt the network, there are still some communities that don't break up uh, very easily. And we also did multiple core identification by breaking large communities into reclustering them to identify smaller chunks of nodes which are more uh, important and so on. Okay, so this is our, uh, this is a classic ensemble uh, cl clustering. So we have node 1, node 2, node 3 here and algo 1 predicts um, node 1 and 3 to be in the same community whereas algo 2 predicts, uh, I mean, uh, and 2 is in a separate community. Here all three nodes are in the same community. Here all three nodes are in different communities. And if you s compare across these three algorithms, you see that two out of three times n1 and n2 are n1 and n3 are in the same community so how often is there consensus in where these nodes fall into different communities right so each each algorithm will give you a different kind of clustering so across these algorithms what is the consensus and uh, so on and we then took this matrix as an adjacency matrix for some hypothetical network and did clustering on this matrix. And we basically did a filtering to build a similarity network and did classic modularity maximization, which is uh, modularity is Newman's uh, uh, measure. And you basically try to f uh, make a modularity, uh, make a community assignment that maximizes the modularity of the community. And the next idea we tried was how do you identify persistent communities? So, what we did was we randomly dropped. 1% of the edges in the network and did this about 100 times. So you generate 100 networks. Each of this hun these 100 networks will have a different output for clustering through whatever any algorithm that you try. So you take an algorithm, you run it across each of these 100 realizations of your original network and now run the ensemble cl clustering idea again. Right? So detect the communities and construct a community assignment vector. And again, use Jacquard similarity build, to build a similarity network and modularity maximization on the resulting network. So this was one approach. Then the next approach was, how do you prune out less important nodes from a module? So our idea was to pick nodes that form better communities. And we use a score of having far more outgoing edges than internal edges and so on. So these are, uh, so these are measures of a good community and so on. And we basically pruned down these existing large communities predicted from our classic algorithms based on these measures. Okay. This was the final um, story. If you see, uh, this was the winning method. This was the best of the methods. And even for the best method, you see that uh, you know it, it makes predictions of like a few thousand communities, but only 24 of them are actually uh, relevant in disease and so on. Um, and our approach, it turns out, has typically a much higher hit ratio. So these are all our approaches, the other columns that you see here. And if you see the, the bold numbers are typically in this based on the highest hit ratio in each, uh, in each row. But the point being, this was a very difficult problem. And essentially, what is the use of this solving this problem even? Right? This helps you to establish a baseline without biological knowledge. Obviously, if you start putting in biological knowledge, you can come up with much better predictions. But here, we went in completely blind, completely unarmed networks. I just know 1, 2, 3. I don't know what is P53, what is Jack, what is uh, IL-17 or you know, whatever. So I have a completely anonymized network and still you are able to make some reasonable predictions of nodes which are likely to work together just based on network properties. So this was the idea. And uh, so our, uh, our algorithm is described in detail in this paper. And uh, you can read, uh, and it's you know, partly also explained in the supplementary material of this paper, but this has several other methods that you would want to read about for 
community detection for this very purpose. So that brings me to the end of the first part of my talk. I'm going to switch gears and talk about how do you use these kinds of networks. I'm completely switching gears. I'm going to talk about metabolic networks and how do you predict novel metabolic pathways. This is a very classic problem. Um, from school you would have, you might remember this. <clears throat> so you'll have one molecule, two question marks, and a third molecule, second molecule, and you have to say what are the reactions. You'll say something like, you know, from your memorized organic chemistry, you'll say use some diels alder reaction or copper 573 Kelvin, something like that. And then you can, you will get this uh, new molecule on the right hand side. But today you don't need to worry on your, uh, uh, worry about your memory of organic chemistry reactions. What you can do is, you can digest all of these reactions, you can learn these reactions, learn patterns of transformations from these reactions and use them to make predictions of what is the most plausible way to convert molecule 1 to molecule 2. And this is uh, nowadays known as retrosynthesis. I have this molecule, you tell me how to reverse engineer essentially, right? How do you retrosynthesize this molecule? I have a molecule of interest, tell me what molecule I can use to synthesize this and what reactions I should uh, perform on that molecule. And by reaction, we essentially say mean enzymes. So if I put this enzyme, it will transform it to this. If I put the next enzyme, it will transform it to the next uh, um, molecule. So can we build a fully automated engine to predict pathways between two molecules, relying only on structural information? No mechanism, no delta G, uh, no stuff that is difficult to obtain. But this is very, very democratically available. Everybody has access to thousands of reactions in um, maybe there are 10, 20 databases of uh, chemical reactions. There's also this famous US patent data set. That's mostly organic reactions. Here we focused on biochemical reactions, meaning enzymatic reactions. So what was our approach? We represented every molecule as a graph. Okay, we, we were talking about protein networks on the one hand and now you just zoom in, zoom in, zoom into that network. A single molecule is a graph, which means every atom is a node and every bond is an edge. Okay? So from this, essentially any chemical reaction is nothing but a transformation of one graph to another graph. And what is this transformation? You cut some nodes, you cut some edges, you add some edges. You break some bonds, you make some bonds. You cut some edges, add some edges. And then we did what is known as, uh, uh, and we first of all need to map reactants and products. A classic reaction would be glucose plus ATP giving glucose 6-phosphate plus ADP. Now even a child will, even a 10th standard biology student will tell you that glucose is getting converted to glucose 6-phosphate and ATP is the one that is converted to ADP. But you need to infer that. So what we do is we see, we look at the subgraph similarities of these two reactions uh, of, the, of the left hand side and the right hand side and assign what is the main backbone transformation that's happening. So, because you can actually assume that glucose is getting converted to ADP and then you can say ADP is getting converted to pyruvate and you can also have a two step glycolysis which doesn't make any biological sense. So you need to track the main backbone transformation that's happening. So that is something that we uh, uh, looked at here. And we do an automatic assignment which is, uh, um, performs really well. It's, I think it was about 93% accuracy when compared to Keg's manual assignment of, uh, they call it R pairs. And then we did subgraph mining to identify the action, the center of action. So there is, a, there is an atom which is finally, you know, losing a carbon or losing an oxygen bond or something like that, CO bond or CH bond, something is broken. So what is the center of that action? And then we also identified a reaction signature. So our assumption is that a reaction happens because there is, a, there is an atom, but that enzyme won't look at all atoms of all C atoms. The alcohol dehydrogenase finally acts at a CO bond, but it won't hit all CO bonds, but that C has to have some neighborhood for this to happen. Okay, so this was the assumption and we basically then made a reaction rule which says if you find the signature, this enzyme can act on this signature to transform it to another signature. And you can infer back what molecule, so if you have uh, ethanol, it will become acetaldehyde, if you have butanol, it will become butanol and so on. So you can generalize based on this information. And we stuck these reaction rules onto a reaction rule network where edges connect rules that can be successively applied. So which then beautifully reduces our problem 
of retrosynthesis of doing that prediction of A question mark question mark B to a problem of path finding on a network. Path finding is very simple. We do it on Google Maps every day. The same algorithm you apply it on the reaction rule network and you will be able to make this prediction. We also had some heuristics that give you, when, when you use Google Maps, you, autom you manually choose. Do you want a, a faster route or a cheaper route or something like that. Whereas here, the, the choice is we had a heuristic which looks at minimal chemical changes in each step and it turns out that that is able to recover the correct pathway in most cases, even in central metabolism where you can actually have a lot of variety of transformations. And uh, so we predicted correct retrosynthetic pathways in most cases and the most important thing about this algorithm is we use only structural information. No delta G, no atom mapping, uh, no mechanistic information and so on. I have a, st uh, I have a structure of a molecule and I have a structure of the product molecule, there is a transformation. I view it as a graph whatever but then completely through this uh, we are able to make this uh, prediction. And I think the interesting part is now we are trying to extend this for, um, you know, predicting new drug molecules and things like that. So how do you use, say, reinforcement learning to, to predict new molecules that can be made using this kind of reaction signatures and uh, a reaction rule space and things like that. Okay. So with that, I'll go to the last part of my talk. So I'm nearing the end of my talk. I just have a few more slides. So this is trying to learn from network structure. And what is the idea here? Uh, this was inspired by a paper which um, uh, it's, uh, there are some centrality measures called uh, Rolex and things like that which are based on the role a particular node plays in a network and things like that. And uh, I think the data set was interesting. They used something like a movie actor data set or something like that. And they were able to predict that certain actors play certain kind of roles in movies. Okay, so they were able to generate, so that's based on just how people co-starred with different people in movies. Maybe the law of the theater has something to do with this. But essentially, they use centrality to predict that a particular node has a particular role. The idea is simple here. Can you use this, um, can you predict essential genes across organisms? If you see, there are a lot of papers which have the first uh, uh, picture that I showed you and, say, and talk about something known as a centrality lethality hypothesis. And uh, this is the hottest uh, controversy, permanent hot controversy where everybody will keep fighting about centrality, lethality and power law distributions in biological networks. And the, the point being, uh, th there is this notion that more central a node, more likely it is to be uh, important in a network. So more likely it is to be lethal, it will be lethal if you remove it from the uh, network and so on. But, but this is an obviously flawed thing because you can Im immediately imagine that if you had a gene duplication event, you will have two highly connected nodes, neither of which are important because the other one can uh, compensate for the other node. So there are obviously such exceptions, but the catch is, this is a very catchy hypothesis. So can we extend it in terms of, don't just look at the degree centrality, don't just look at the degree, but look at a battery of centrality measures. With that, are you able to predict uh, if a particular node is essential or not, a particular protein is essential or not. So we used uh, interactive information which is available in droves from databases such as the string and essentiality information is very sparse, experimental essentiality information. So we have it only for about 30 odd organisms. So we use this to train models which could try and predict based on a number of centrality measures. So it turns out that with just 12 centrality measure, measures, we achieved a fairly high accuracy. And when I say high, it was, you know, I think in the high 80s. Uh, and this is useful for experimentalists because they know where to try some new experiments and so on. This is not like a, a gold standard kind of approach. But the whole idea of computational biology is to tell the experimentalists where to train, where to spend their money on. <laughs> Because there are too many experiments to be done and can you actually focus on the experiments that are most informative, most rewarding in terms of insights and so on. And um, we also try to add these sequence based features and it turns out it's only a marginal improvement in performance. So not really that helpful. So this is a, a very clean, simple database that's hosted off GitHub actually. Uh, and you can go and look at predictions for any organism of your interest for, which is there in string. So it takes a string network and makes predictions on what are the most likely genes to be essential and uh, so on. Okay, so 
so then to quickly summarize the three different things I uh, talked about today, there are many applications of graph theory or networks in biology. So for those of you who haven't been exposed to graph theory, please do consider doing like some course, some online course or listen to a few lectures on graph theory because I think it has like lots of applications. Um, the first problem I talked to you was about module identification in biological networks. It's an important and challenging task. And uh, even though we had like six networks where there is information you can correlate across the network, but still a very challenging problem to solve. And there are, because there are many unique al uh, challenges in applying traditional community detection algorithms. It's a very well solved or well studied problem, but to uh, apply them to biological networks, there are many uh, challenges. And um, so these are the three things I would say. So learning on networks, just disease modules, and using the network structure, the graph structure, and so on. Uh, uh, from it was the reaction minor part where we predicted uh, reaction transformation and learning from the the role of different nodes in a network and so on to predict say essential genes and so on so this is roughly what uh, three different types of applications of machine learning three different networks uh, okay maybe two different networks so on on the one hand we had um, protein networks uh, in the first and the third one in the second one, we had two types of networks where we said a molecule is a network in the first place and then also a reaction rule network which we will use to predict uh, uh, the correct way of retrosynthesizing a particular molecule. Okay, with that, I would like to acknowledge a lot of my uh, students and uh, collaborating faculty who made this possible. So, um, uh, Bitika and Karthik were involved in the uh, community detection problem. Karthik was also involved in uh, the uh, uh, NetGenes uh, problem, Karthik and Sendamaran. Uh, and um, uh, Aravind was the one who was involved in uh, the reaction minor problem using subgraph mining and so on. And we really must uh, acknowledge my faculty colleagues uh, from computer science because uh, I always say this, we typically have some very nice ideas, but it's very difficult to implement them in practice if you don't have efficient algorithms and data structures. So subgraph mining wouldn't have been possible but for the kind of data structures that Cheyenne came up with uh, and so on and um, uh, Ravi and Himanshu were of, co of course you know helpful in multiple uh, projects. Okay, So that's it. Uh, so if you want any more information so please do uh, write to me. I'll be happy to share. Uh, um, all our codes are typically on GitHub but if you have any further questions on any of the things discussed today I'll be more than happy to engage. Thank you. Thanks Karthik. Uh, there's time for a few questions. Uh, so, uh, so uh, if there are multiple possibility to get a same product, uh, so there could be different reactant which is actually leading to same product. So, how does uh, reaction minor actually? Yeah, so, so we have a huge, we have a way to rank these pathways. So, ultimately, it it returns a list of ranked pathways. So, this ranking is based on a heuristic. You could typically use something like delta G, but our idea was we will not use delta G because it is not reliably computable. There are methods to predict it and so on, but it is not readily available at least. So can we just use the structure and make these predictions? So in fact, the heuristic we used was very simple. We said at every time, at every point, you try to walk towards the final product, but only make a minimal change. Do not make a large wholesale chemical change. That means, so, in, and that results in potentially longer pathways but looks like they are more biologically feasible. And because this is a very nice question that we all always have. Uh, why is glycolysis the way it is? Can you have a shorter glycolysis? And there are people like you know synthetic biologists and so on who have been trying to make uh, you know even a non-oxidative glycolysis and things like that. But I think the, the approximate wisdom is that glycolysis that we see, the 10 step glycolysis that we see is uh, most optimal uh, way in terms of delta G at the same time maximizing ATP. So if this double trade-off is what is achieved by the current glycolysis. If you want to, if you did not care about so much ATP generation, you might have a shorter pathway. Or if you did not care about delta G, you might still have a shorter pathway. But if you put these two constraints, but this is still hand waving, I do not think people fully understand what is, what is being optimized in nature. Um, so um, you mentioned that uh, the chemicals can be represented as graphs. So, uh, how do you treat double bonds, triple bonds differently? Yes, yes, and also uh, bonds outside the plane and into the plane. Right? Without stereochemistry, you can't do biochemistry, right? Because uh, that's very important. So, we use those as edge labels. So, single and double bonds and um, wedge and dashed bonds are indicated as uh, by separate labels. Questions? 
So as usual, wonderful talk. Uh, Karthik, one query is on your reaction minor. Are there very, uh, do you see a difference in the different enzyme classes that are be like getting better predicted as opposed to something else? Like say for example, okay. isomerases might be a little tricky to Fair point. I think that's a very good question. I don't think we did a systematic analysis of that sort. So a lot of our analysis was we took chunks of, uh, uh, like we took a few example predicted pathways and we made these predictions and also chunks of central carbon metabolism which is potentially difficult to predict. So we looked at some 20, 30 pairs of uh, reactions which are difficult to predict because you have too many possibilities. And in most of the cases we were able to predict the correct pathway in the top one or two or uh, three and so on. But um, I think your point is very valid in terms of maybe this kind of uh, casting the problem is uh, uh, is better at solving certain enzymatic uh, reactions rather than others. I think that's a good thing to think about. Any further questions? So, in the disease module identification dream challenge, how did they get the ground truth? So, it wasn't like a. So, they had this. Um, they had this tool called uh, uh, Pascal, right? So, this was the. This was the way they would score. Uh, the, uh, the the predictions. So you had a prediction that basically goes through a, a, a complete a, a scoring mechanism and a, and a module scoring uh, um, module scoring module to ultimately tell you what is how enriched is a particular module for a disease. This is from Jiva's data sets. If there are no further questions, let's thank Karthik for this wonderful talk again. Thank you. Thanks, Karthik.